Welcome everyone to Straight Science. Straight Science is an evening seminar series put on by UAF, Alaska Sea Grant, and also UAF, University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, Northwest Campus, both of which are in Nome. So UAF, Alaska Sea Grant, and Northwest Campus are public servants for the Bering Street region. And the Bering Street region is the homeland and waters of the Inupiaq, Yupik, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. Tonight, tonight we have a, a, a very technologically amazing straight science. And then we have Bob Picard on top of that. And he's technologically amazing as well. So first off, you can see Bob Picard. He is live on the ship Sekuliak, which is on his opening slide. So they are they have such good... This is a, a national asset. Sekuliak is one of the ships for the country. And right now, University of Alaska Fairbanks has the um, honor of manning it and whatnot. And so Bob Picard is one of the scientists on it currently. And the reception is beautiful. It's amazing, actually. And he is literally sitting off Prudhoe Bay right now. They are underway. He'll tell us a little bit about that. And Bob Picard is the senior scientist at or a senior scientist at the Physical Oceanography Department for the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution at Woods Hole, Massachusetts. But he is on our time zone because he's sitting off of Prudhoe Bay. And he is up studying the fate of the Bering Strait water. So as the waters, we know, all go rolling north, um, He's going to tell us a little bit more about it. He's a physical oceanographer, so I'm sure that will be um, very interesting. And I think Bob Picard was actually on the ship, the Norseman II, that was earlier this summer that caused quite a stir in the region regarding harmful algal blooms, although he is not there to study himself to study harmful algal blooms. I don't know, uh, know that he was on that ship and when all of that was going on. With that, uh, Bob, let's take it away. Beyond the Bering Strait, where does that water go? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Gay. Uh, I just want to make sure that you can see my entire slide. Can it, it's it looks not beautiful? Being blocked. Okay, super. All right. Good. Well, thanks for the introduction and uh, greetings to everyone from uh, from the research vessel Sekuliak. And as Gay said, uh, we're sitting off of Prudhoe Bay this evening, um, quite close actually, we saw the lights, and we're sitting in highly concentrated ice, and we're slowly making our way uh, westward uh, towards, um, towards Point Barrow. And um, so uh, I'm the chief scientist on, on, the, uh, on the cruise. My name is Bob Pickard I'm from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And, and tonight I'd like to tell you a bit about the science that, that we're doing uh, on the vessel and also tell you a little bit about the uh, ship itself, the operation of the ship and how it helps us to uh, get these measurements that are so exciting. Okay, so, um, so for those of you from Nome and the Bering Strait region, um, you're all keenly aware of how important Bering Strait is um, to the global ocean. It's a, uh, a, uh, the only gateway from which Pacific water enters the Arctic Ocean. And on average, uh, the flow through the strait is about 1 million cubic meters per second. And um, to get a feel for that number, that's about 150 Yukon rivers. So that seems like a lot of water, um, but actually in oceanographic standards, um, it's really just a trickle of water. And uh, like by way of comparison, the Gulf Stream transports more than 100 times that amount. So it, it's really not a lot of water in oceanographic uh, uh, standards, but it's a really important trickle. And it's important for lots of reasons. And here's a few of them. Uh, the cold water that flows through the strait is the primary source of nutrients to the Western Arctic. And that spurs the whole um, primary production and, and, and at the base of the, of the, um, of the food chain. Uh, the warm Pacific water brings heat into the Arctic that melts the sea ice in spring and summer. The fresh Pacific water strongly influences the stratification of the water column. And uh, phytoplankton, zooplankton, other biogenic material enter the Arctic uh, via Bering Strait uh, in the Pacific water. So it's really important for lots of reasons. 
So I thought I would start the talk tonight, um, taking you back about 20 years, which is when I started working in the Arctic Ocean. Um, and my first program uh, took place in 2002, so exactly 20 years. And I thought it would be fun to show you this picture. This is um, the very first figure from my very first Arctic paper. So figure one from my first paper. And um, it has a schematic of the flow coming through Bering Strait. And, and I thought I would go through the caption here. Uh, the ca caption says, the schematic of the two main branches of Pacific origin water flowing through the Chukchi Sea. The Eastern branch is the Alaskan coastal current there, right? And then I highlighted the next sentence. Presumably, both branches turn and flow eastward toward the Beaufort Sea upon reaching the shelf break. So that really tells you that we didn't know a heck of a lot about the fate of the Pacific water at that point. All right, we, you know, we really didn't know what happened to that water once it exited the Chukchi Sea. So my hypothesis for my very first field program was that a good portion of the water turned to the right at Point Barrow, as it, exiting Barrow Canyon, and it would form a boundary current right along the edge of the shelf. So what I did is I put a mooring array across that part of the outer shelf and the upper slope, essentially like a picket fence to try to catch all the water that might be going by, okay? And um, so the array was unique for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was it was the first high resolution array uh, along the boundary of, of the Arctic Ocean. In other words, I had a lot of moorings spaced very close, closely together. And the other unique aspect was that I used what we call profiling instrumentation. So my sensors here, um, they were actually um, encased with a motor and they would travel up and down the mooring wire uh, four times a day, all right, to give us profiles. So they give a pro profiles of temperature, salinity, and we also had velocity, acoustic velocity sensors down here that would also give us profiles. So we got these really nice snapshots of, of most of the water column four times a day, which was kind of unprecedented at that time to get that much information. So what did we learn? So we indeed learned that part of the Pacific water does indeed turn to the right and flows um, towards the um, Eastern Beaufort Sea along the edge of the shelf. And, and I'm showing you here the two-year mean velocity vectors. So you can see the strong flow, the flow is strongest right near the shelf edge. So that was a, a really important thing to learn that yes, okay, that's, that's where part of the Pacific water goes. Now, because of these profilers, we had the ability to, to, to uh, again, take these snapshots. And what I did was I essentially um, made seasonal averages of these, of these, of these uh, slices through the water. And I'm gonna show you some of the seasonal averages here. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a few pictures and just to explain what you're looking at here, all right? Um, you're looking to the west, all right? So there's the edge of the shelf, all right? And there's the Beaufort shelf. And on this side is the velocity in color, all right, in centimeters per second. And in this side is the temperature uh, in, in, in color, in degrees uh, Celsius. So in spring, essentially, that flow is strongest near the bottom and it carries quite cold water. That's what happens in spring. Then in summer, it's a different situation. Now the water is flowing most strongly near the surface and it's carrying quite warm water, right? So quite different. Now I, I wanna point out that there's a blank here and the reason that blank is there is we have no data up there. And that's because my profilers could not go all that close to the surface, all right? You couldn't get them too close to the ice because the ridging of the ice could come down and destroy your mooring. So we had to stay about 35, 40 meters below uh, the surface. Um, anyway, so those are the, the spring uh, and the summer. And then in the winter, again, um, it, the flow is back to being strongest near the bottom. It extended a little bit deeper and it's actually flowing in the opposite direction a little bit. So when I created these um, seasonal averages, I was kind of struck myself by how warm it was in, in, in the winter months, all right? So here's sort of where the current is, and, and these are pretty warm temperatures, a lot warmer than the spring. And I was wondering why, and it turns out the reason why is because of storms, believe it or not. So um, it's no surprise that the Arctic is a stormy place. And uh, there are, in this neck of the woods of the Arctic, there are two different types of storms that impact the region. Uh, there are what we call Arctic-borne storms, all right? Those are storms that are spun up in the Arctic domain, and, and here's a satellite shot of one of these uh, storms. Here's the low pressure, and this, the flow around the, uh, the low is doing this, and these low pressure systems tend to sweep down here along the north slope, okay? And when they do, they're circulating like this, you get these really strong westerly winds right along the coast, all right? And those westerly winds pile up the water and cause a storm surge, 
And uh, that storm surge can be quite devastating in terms of cause, causing erosion along the north slope. So, so that's the, the first type of storm. The second type of storm is what we call a Pacific born storm. And you're also quite familiar with those <laughs> where you live. Um, those travel along the North Pacific storm track. And here's a satellite image of one of these storms sitting in the Gulf of Alaska. There's the, there's the center glow. And now the air is going around like this. And this storm is so powerful and so broad that some of the air comes up and flows along the north slope. And now the, the uh, wind direction is the opposite. Okay, it's flowing from the east towards the west. Okay, these are easterlies. Now, these storms are powerful and they happen, you know, they're, they're quite common. And when they do, they really disrupt what's going on at, at, at this location. So back to the mean situation, this is what I showed you earlier. Okay, we have that strong current right at the edge of the shelf. And now I've overlaid the wind vectors, these little gray vectors here. So that's the mean winds. The mean winds are coming out of the east. They're only a few knots, not very strong in the mean. But when you get one of these Pacific uh, born storms, you can see the wind really howls out of the northeast, all right? And the flow actually reverses and goes in the other direction. So I just want to toggle back and forth there. It's a striking difference when you get those winds, all right? And again, these storms are, are somewhat common. Uh, they happen all throughout the year. Uh, re, it, and you can get a response like this, regardless of whether you have ice on the surface or, or not. Um, and it only takes a matter of hours before the flow will actually reverse. You know, the winds pick up about six hours later, the flow can reverse. So that's one thing that the storm does. The other thing the storm does is it rearranges the water. All right, and that's really important. So back to our seasonal averages here. This is what I showed you earlier. In each of these averages, you can see the warm water here down below, okay? And that is actually not Pacific water, that's Atlantic water. That's water that came from the Atlantic Ocean that has circulated all the way around to this neck in the woods. And it's normally down deep. But when you get one of these Pacific born storms, here the flow reverses. But now look, all that warm water gets drawn up along the slope and actually onto the shelf, all right? And that's a process that we call upwelling. And it's really important. And what it does is it brings up from below it brings up heat, salt, nutrients, dissolved organic carbon, zooplankton, and other things. All right, so these upwelling storms really play havoc on, on this region. So there's lots of questions. Does the amount and the properties of the Pacific water flowing eastward in this boundary current change from year to year? If so, what dictates this? How does the changing storm climate impact the exchange of material between the shelf and the basin? And I say changing storm climate is, I told you about the two different types of storms and, and it's predicted that with our warming climate, we're gonna get more of these storms and they're gonna be more powerful. So it's really um, important to understand their impact. Um, what effect does the decreasing ice presence have? And finally, how does the Pacific water impact the ecosystem? For example, uh, the presence of whales. So it's, way too logistically um, difficult and too expensive to keep seven moorings uh, deployed in this area uh, year round. So we have now uh, gone to maintaining a single optimally placed mooring, all right? And, and, and so I've marked the mooring with the red star here and it's optimally placed because it's right in the center of the current. It's in the center of the current in the spring, in the summer, also in the winter, which I'm not showing, but it's also in the center of the current during these storm events, okay? So it's really well placed and we can learn a lot about the, the, the whole current just by having that one single mooring. And I do wanna point out that the mooring is supported by the National Science Foundation uh, and in particular, the Arctic Observing Network. So it's an interdisciplinary mooring. Um, we can measure a host of things, the water velocity, the ice velocity, the ice thickness, the temperature, salt content, chlorophyll, nitrate. Uh, we have an acoustic proxy for zooplankton. And we also measure marine mammal presence. And we do that with one of those passive uh, acoustic receivers down at the bottom of the mooring that can measure um, marine mammal calls. So the interdisciplinary mooring sheds light on how the ecosystem responds to the physical drivers. By physical drivers, I mean things like storms, all right? Um, so for an example, um, let's look at bowhead whale calls. All right, so this is from the mooring. And what I've done is I've used four years of mooring data from 2008 to 2012. And we plotted up the seasonal distribution of the bowhead whale calls. And there are two peaks, one in spring and one in fall. And the one in spring, of course, is associated with the spring migration. 
Um, but I want to point out that um, in the spring, the bowheads are somewhat constrained to, to sort of stay in, in near, near the coast here, near, near the edge of the shelf, uh, because of the presence of the ice. So you have this, you know, what, what could be called the spring corridor where the ice starts, uh, first starts to melt back uh, in the spring, and that allows the whales to take that route. Okay, so that's the spring. But in the fall, there's no such constraint. So, so here's an ice image of the fall, and you can see the ice edge is way offshore, okay? So there's really no reason a priori when the whales are coming back that they would have to, you know, go by the mooring, all right? They have lots of choices, but yet there's a peak. So, so, so why is that? And, and we think the answer to that, um, it has to do with these specific born storms again, all right? So as I, as I mentioned earlier, when the storm comes and you get this upwelling, you take the zooplankton and you bring it right on up, and uh, that's what the bowhead whales are feeding on. So we think uh, that's the, you know, the reason why they'll stay in this region. And of course, using the mooring, we can measure how much upwelling is going on. And so that's what this plot is showing you. This is the monthly percentage of strong upwelling storms over the same four year period. And indeed, there's a spring peak in upwelling and there's a fall peak in upwelling. So uh, you know, that's pretty compelling. And, and one interesting uh, aspect here is that with climate change, if we're gonna get less and less um, ice in the spring, you know, you're going to get a, a, an earlier meltback, uh, then the whales may not be constrained uh, anymore to stay near the coast in the spring, yet here's a food source for them in the spring due to the upwelling. So that might be something to keep them uh, close uh, to, to the uh, shelf break. So the upwelling is becoming more frequent and more stronger, and I said that's actually being predicted by, by climate models. So here, using a proxy um, of, um, and wind data from the, from the Barrow Airport um, Met Station, we plotted the number of upwelling events and the, the wind speed during the upwelling events uh, starting from 1940. And you can see that both of these things have increased in recent years, okay? So that means that there's more nutrients and more zooplankton brought up from, from um, the, uh, brought up to the Beaufort Shelf from the deep basin, right? However, we now know from this mooring, all right, that the shelf edge current is becoming weaker in time. All right, and that means less nutrients and zooplankton are being brought to the region from the Bering Strait. All right, so these things are kind of counteracting each other, and which one is going to win out and dictate what's going on? Well, we don't know that yet, but that's one of the reasons why we want to have a, a mooring in here for a long term, a long time, uh, to try to you know continue the measurement program and sort out this response to the warming climate. So that's one example of how we're using our mooring. All right, so that brings us to the cruise that we're on now, uh, this uh, 2022 Sekuliak cruise. And uh, here's, here's a, a nice picture of kind of what it's been like for a lot of the time. Uh, we have a lot of dark and we have a lot of ice and we've had a fair amount of snow. So this is, this is staring out the, the, the window of the bridge and, and looking at the spotlights. So we, we have a lot of that. So why are we out here? Well. The number one priority why we're out here is to recover and redeploy that mooring that I told you about. All right, we want to every two years, we want to turn that thing around and make sure that we continue that nice long time series. Now we're out here in November. And as you all know, November is a time of freeze up. So uh, that makes it really interesting scientifically to be out here, but it also makes it logistically uh, more challenging. And of course, it's because of trying to work in the ice. So here's a, a really nice uh, nighttime visual image uh, of the region. And uh, in this image, you can see that the Chukchi Sea over here is open water, all right? And these are, these are clouds that you're seeing in that image, but it's open water. And over here in the Beaufort, this is where we have the pack ice, all right? And this is all newly formed first year pack ice, all right? Um, and up here, uh, it's a bit more consolidated, as you can see, and it's a little bit older. But down here in our working area, it's younger, and it's much more dynamic. And the reason why it's dynamic and moving around is because of the combination of the currents and the wind, okay? So and again, it, it, it really um, makes it an interesting place to be. So uh, I do wanna point out, it's a pretty cool aspect of this image is that it's a nighttime visual image, which means that we're using the moonlight. The moonlight is the source of light that allows us to see this, uh, see this uh, scape here. And uh, I'll point out that you can actually see the lights of Oktyagvik here and, and the lights of Prudhoe. All right, and in fact, you can often see the lights of our ship. And here's an image that shows the lights of the Sukuliak uh, during this trip. This was taken just a few days ago. So um, here we are during freeze up, lots of ice. And when we got up to this region after leaving Nome, 
uh, we essentially encountered the mooring and it was covered by ice. All right, so, so that makes it a little bit more challenging to service the mooring in the presence of ice. But of course, the Sukuliak is, is no stranger to, to doing mooring operations in ice. All right, they're, they're quite adept at it and that came into play here and allowed us to do, to do our work. But I wanted to, to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the procedure because it was really fascinating. It is really fascinating to see this happen. So what you're looking at here is, is a photograph that I took on the bridge that's showing the display, one of their displays, showing where the ship is, all right? So it looks like a mess, but let me walk you through this. So when I took this picture, the ship was here, all right? And the mooring was here, all right? And we were slowly um, approaching the mooring and we were about to send an acoustic signal and release the anchor and allow the mooring to float up to the surface. So we were about to do that when I snapped this picture. But before I snapped the picture, the ship went ahead and did a whole bunch of lines going back and forth. And, and the purpose for that was to, to, to try to break up the ice a little bit, because we don't want that mooring to pop up underneath a thick piece of ice, because we won't be, you know, it'll make it much more difficult to get it, and it could hurt the sensors that are on the top of the mooring. So the ship went back and forth and tried to break it up a little bit. And lo and behold, when we released the mooring, it surfaced in one of those leads that the ship had made. So this is like textbook, all right? It doesn't always happen this way, but it happened this time. And it was just really brilliant to see quick, that, quick you know, question, operation Bob. we did that morning. Quick question, sure. this is Gay. Um, people may not be familiar with what is a mooring and what is popping up. And so I don't know if you can talk about that just for a little sec about how it's anchored down with a long string and all that. Sure. I did Thanks. show a mooring diagram a little bit ago, so okay. maybe I can go back to that. There we go. Okay, yes. Yeah, good question, uh, Gay. Let me walk you through this. So so here's the, here is a mooring, all right? So here's the sea surface. Here's the bottom. And essentially, it's a long wire with a really heavy anchor, 3,000 pounds, all right? And this top float is what we call it, is, is really big, 64 inches, and it's very buoyant, all right? So this holds the wire taut. And along the wire, we have all this instrumentation, all right? We have temperature sensors, salinity sensors, we have a fluorometer, um, and we have something for measuring nitrate. Uh, we have velocity measurements, all those things that you're seeing over here. And down here is the whale recorder, all right? So what happens when we, when we turn the mooring around, the ship is sitting over here on the surface, and we send an acoustic message down to this release here, all right? And we say, okay, release the mooring. So it opens up, it, it leaves the anchor at the bottom, and the rest of this comes screaming to the top because this is so buoyant. So what we don't want is this thing to be screaming up and smack thick ice, okay? Because it'll be trapped under the ice, number one, and number two, there's instruments there that could get damaged, okay? So that's what we're doing when we're trying to recover. So that's why I was really pleased to see this mooring pop up in open water. Now, if it would have popped up all around there, it would have been fine too, because it was all kind of broken up by the ship, all right? So we see the mooring on the water, and now we want to go get it. So the ship drives slowly towards the mooring, all right? And then uh, one of the scientists leans over with a pole and grabs on to the mooring with a line, and then we bring it back to the stern of the ship, and then we raise that mooring up. So here's the top float of the mooring. It's been in the water for two years, so you can see it's quite dirty. And we bring that up, and then we bring the rest of the mooring up, all the instruments after that, and get them onto the deck. And then, then we're set, all right? So this was a, a, you know, it took us about two hours to do that, and we had the mooring on board. So then the next thing we do is uh, we prepare to redeploy it, all right? So we have a new top float. You can see that right here. And we have new instruments. So the next day, we went back to the same site. We parked the ship over the site, and then we lowered the mooring back into the water, all right? And we did that sort of just the opposite, all right? Um, because of the ice, we had to do the anchor first. So there's the anchor, uh, again, the three-ton anchor being lowered over the side, all right? And then we attach the instruments one by one as the anchor is lowered deeper and deeper into the water. And then the very last thing we do, of course, is attach that top float, all right? So this is gonna go down onto the water and then we release that, all right? And then the anchor just pulls it right down to the bottom, all right? And this top float will reside about 30 meters below the surface to, to keep it safe from the ice. So that's how we got it back in the water. And you can see we had a gorgeous day to do this, all right? It was very cold, but, but hardly any wind. And you can see we had a beautiful uh, this, uh, region of open water uh, behind the ship that allowed us to do the work, okay? So we got the mooring in and out really nice despite the presence of ice. 
So now let me take a few minutes to talk about some of the data that, that the mooring has. I told you about that example using the, the, um, the, the, uh, the bowhead whale calls, but let me tell you a little bit about the, the different types of water, because I'm a physical oceanographer and that's the kind of thing that I do. So here I'm showing you one year of data. This is from the very first year that we had the mooring in the water. All right, and what I'm showing you here is this is the surface and this is the bottom. All right, so this is the depth and this is time going across here. So this is August and this is the next August from 2002 to 2003. And the colors are temperature, all right? So the temperature of the water can range from near the freezing point to the red stuff is quite warm. It's you know five to seven degrees Celsius, which is a little bit over 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can see we had lots of different types of water, all right? In late uh, fall, and uh, uh, late summer and early fall, we had what we call Alaskan coastal water. And that's really warm, buoyant water that's run off from the coast of Alaska, and it's just made its way all the way through Bering Strait, all the way around Point Barrow, and into this current, all right? Then in the spring, we have what we call newly formed winter water, and that's just the opposite. It's really, really cold water near the freezing point, and it's formed in the Bering Sea and the Chukchi Sea, and again, it makes its way north around Point Barrow, and then we see it in the springtime. So those are two, two very different extremes. In the early summer, we have another type of summer water, okay? We call that Bering summer water, and this came from the central Bering Shelf. So it's not quite as warm and not quite as fresh, all right? And then the last thing we, we see in this uh, graph is we see these sort of spikes of warm water, and that's those upwelling events. Those that are the storm events I told you about earlier, and that's how we see them in the mooring, okay? They appear as these warm spikes. So we have a lot of stuff going on, and this is just one year. All right, and now at this point, we have almost 20 years of data, a couple of years where, where we didn't have the mooring in, but most years we, we had it. So now I'm gonna show you um, a bunch of these things from 2014 to, to the present. And when I say the present, it was really just about 10 days ago that we pulled that mooring out of the water. So it went into early November. So I'm not gonna walk through this, but I'm just gonna point out that you can see it's just really rich in terms of, of how things change. I mean, generally you see the warm water in the fall, the cold water in the spring, okay? That's what I showed you earlier, but you can see things change from year to year. Like this year or 2019, we had a ton of really warm water and compare that to 2015 where we had, you know, very little of that warm water. And then look at the, the, the cold winter water. It shows up at different times of the year, okay? So lots of going on here and we're trying to sort it all out. So let's just take a, a, a couple of minutes and consider the, just the presence of that cold winter water, all right? And, 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 and that's really important water, all right? And I, it, it, I mentioned earlier in the talk, in the introduction, that this winter water is critical for the ecosystem because it contains the nutrients that spur the primary production, okay? So that's at the base of the food chain. So the most nutrient-rich water anywhere here, even in your neck of the woods, is in this cold winter water, all right? So that's really important. The other really important aspect of this winter water is once it gets out into the middle of the basin, okay, it sort of sinks down a bit and it covers that warm Atlantic water, all right? And it acts like a cap, all right? And that's really important because if that cap were not there, then you could take that warm water and you could mix up towards the surface and it could melt the ice. And there's enough heat in that Atlantic water to melt the entire, the, the entire polar ice cap. So this winter water is a critical part of the Arctic system. All right, and our mooring is telling us some neat things about it. So now here's the, the full 20 year record. Again, this is time going from August to August. All right, and this is year going from 2002, the first year I had it up until the present. And simple graph, I've just marked in the color blue here every time we see that really cold water. All right, so there it is, 20 years worth of it. So let's try to understand it. Well, the first thing you can do is try to understand how it changes seasonally by averaging all of the August months, all of the September months, all of the November months, do that for each month of the year, and this is what you get. And you can see, okay, this is something your eye can sort of tell you by looking at that, but most of that cold winter water goes by in the spring. There it is, all right? So that's one way to look at it, but how about from year to year? We can also average going this way, average one year, and then average another year, average another year. And we do that on this side, all right? And this tells us that from year to year, you get very different things, all right? So I can tell you that in Bering Strait, the moorings in Bering Strait have been uh, sort of suggesting that this winter water is, is, is not as prevalent as it used to be. 
So we, one might expect that downstream where I am, you might start to see that trend, but we don't see anything like that so far. I don't see any trend. You know, it's some years there's no winter water like this year, but that's not, you know, unheard of. There were other years with no winter water. So it's going to be interesting and a challenge for us to figure out, you know, what this variability is all about. So, you know, the two big questions or two of the big questions is how is this yearly variation related to the Bering Strait inflow that's going by your doorstep? And how is it related to the atmospheric forcing over the Chukchi Sea and also over the, the uh, Beaufort Sea? Okay, so that's, uh, that's the mooring story. Now, we have another priority while we're out here on a cruise, and that is to do a large-scale survey of the current system, okay, on the ship itself. All right, the, the mooring's safely in the water for another two years, and now we're going to explore and try to, to look at a larger-scale view of, of the current system, all right? So, again, we're dealing with ice, and that makes it logistically uh, challenging. And uh, I have up here that navigating our way through the ice requires great skill and, and, and lots of patience. And, and the Sekuliak has lots of both. Uh, and that's great for us. So we start our day at 10 o'clock uh, with, an, with an ice brief on the bridge, all right? And the ice brief is given by our resident ice expert, Steve here, who's an absolute whiz in dealing with uh, ice imagery. So Steve comes up and he briefs uh, the captain here, the navigator, the chief scientist, and there's a, the the other two mates are, are out of the picture, but standing right there. So and, and and other interested members are allowed to you know to sit in as well. So Steve goes through and he gives us film loops and he gives us uh, information on how the ice is growing, you know how the winds are in, you know impacting the compression and of the ice and how the leads are looking. As I said, he's an absolute whiz. So we learn a lot about the ice, and then. He can help guide us about decisions, all right? How do we want to try to navigate through this ice to go from point A to point B? So here's an example of that, all right? So this was uh, recently. The Sekuliak is coming down and, and, and occupying this line here. And then we wanted to go over and occupy this line here next, all right? So sometimes we turn around and come back offshore and then transit over. But in this instance, Steve recommended that we actually go along this system of leads over to our point over there, okay? And so that's the kind of information that's, that Steve is uh, giving us, really important, really insightful uh, for us to make our, our decisions. Um, I also wanted to point out, again, the, the satellite imagery is just, uh, just amazing, all right? It's so high resolution that you can actually see the track of the ship. So here's a track of the, of the Sukuliak as seen from a satellite image. Okay, so that so Steve gives us sort of the, the, the large lay of the land on how we want to maneuver the ship. But but then, you know, for for the for the here and now, you're on the bridge, you're driving the ship, and you know, you can see what's in front of you and you have to make decisions, right? Are you gonna try for that lead over there? Are you gonna try to avoid this ridge over there? What are you gonna do? And you know, we have shrinking daylight. So another really important aspect is the ship's ice radar. Okay, and this is just a snapshot of the ice radar. Here's where the ship is. And 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 the and the you know the 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 uh, folks driving a ship use this to try to help them make decisions about again go from one station to the next and you often don't go in a straight line you know you want to go just a few miles uh, to our next site and you're just going to sort of go out of the way and and sort of weave your way through and get from point A to point B. Okay, so the ship is taking us where we want to go and now what are we measuring? All right, so sort of our main instrument or our workhorse instrument, if you will is called a conductivity temperature depth uh, uh, sensor, all right? So CTD for short. And it's mounted on this package here, all right? So this is what we call a CTD package. So here's all the electronics down here, all right? And we're gonna take this package, we're gonna move it out, and then we're gonna lower it into the water, we're gonna bring it down to the bottom, and then we're gonna bring it back up. And as it goes down, these sensors measure temperature, conductivity, and that tells us about the salt content, and they measure other things, such as oxygen, um, turbidity, fluorescence, things like that. So we measure those electronically as the package goes down. Then on, on the way up, we stop the package at numerous spots, numerous depths in the water, and then we use these plastic bottles, which are called Niskin bottles, all right? And, and what these bottles do is they take, they, they take water samples. So you see the end caps here are open, so we send a signal down the wire and they close and they capture the water from a given depth. So we, we have lots of bottles, we can get lots of different depths. And, and what we use the water for is to measure things that you can't measure electronically, all right? Things like nutrients or, or carbon or isotopes, you know, CFCs, things like that. 
So, so that's so that's our workhorse measurement. And now, again, operationally, we're in the ice. We have to be able to do this. So here's where Sekuliak is really well set up. All right, they, they have this uh, room called the Baltic Room, and you're seeing a picture of the Baltic Room in here. It's heated, and this is where the CTD sits um, in between our, our stops. And when we come to the spot where we want to take a measurement, um, the door opens, all right, and then the technician here is, is communicating with the driver, the, uh, the person operating the winch, all right? They pick this thing up and they bring it out. So here's the winch operator and the winch operator can see the Baltic room and he can also see, he or she can also see the, um, the water, all right? So we bring the thing out, boom it out, and then we lower the thing into the water. It goes down to the bottom, it comes back up. That's how we take our measurement. But I wanna point out here, all right? Again, we're in highly concentrated ice and you can see all this ice here, all right? But obviously we can't drop the CTD through the ice. We have to have a little open water pocket. So either we have to find a lead that's close to where we wanna be, or more often, more often than not, we actually have to create the lead with the ship. And, and the ship is really good at that. They, man they maneuver the ship, they use the thrusters, they make a hole, all right? And that's what allows us to, uh, to drop the CTD down and bring it up. Now that's the physical operation. And then we have a watchstander sitting in the ship communicating with the with the winch driver you know telling the winch driver how close we, we need to go to the bottom and here's just a picture of one of our watchstanders uh, she's in the computer room here on the ship and the computer room you can see is just an amazing place um, you can see this bank of computer screens just giving us all the information we need about the various ship systems all right uh, we, we have a little bridge camera here showing what what the view is out from the bridge so that's how we that's how we essentially go through one of these CTD casts, all right? So again, that's our workhorse instrument. And, and what have we been doing? So we came up here and this is where we redeployed the mooring right here. And at that point, we thought it was best to go as far east as we were going to go by steaming, all right, to our easternmost spot. And our easternmost spot is right near Mackenzie Trough, which is where the Mackenzie River comes in. In Canadian waters, there's the border. So we started doing our sections here, and then we work, have been working our way back towards the west doing these sections, all right? And we just finished one tonight, sitting right here, all right? And now we're on our way to the next one, and we're probably sitting about right here as we speak, okay? So these sections, they go far enough offshore that we can capture that boundary current that I told you about, the shelf edge. But you'll also notice that we've taken them very close to the coast, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is because we're out here during freeze up. That's the reason for that, all right? And let me show you what I mean. So let's just take a look at this section here, all right? Now, remember I told you, I showed you those seasonal averages from the mooring, all right? Those slices through the water. So now I'm gonna show you a slice through the water taken from the ship. So it's more like an instantaneous slice. So it's the same type of view, all right? We're still looking towards the west, all right? There's the edge of the shelf and there's the Beaufort shelf here land is over here. And now the color again is temperature. So this is very cold water and this is not so cold water over here. But I want to stress what's really fascinating about this is this is that newly formed winter water that I was telling you about how important it is, all right? Except that this winter water did not come from the Bering Sea, did not come from the Chukchi Sea and go through, you know, Barrow Canyon and go by the mooring. This is being formed as we speak right now on the Beaufort Shelf. And we know much less about this process than we do in, uh, about the process in, in the Chukchi and the Bering. So it's just a really uh, wonderful opportunity to learn about the formation of this water uh, right here during the freeze up. So this is why we're taking those sections all the way as close to the land as we can. And one of the great things about the Sekuliak is it's got a, a relatively shallow draft. So it allows us to get pretty close to the coast. So one of the ways to look at this winter water is, is we make a, a, a what we call a simple scatter plot uh, where we just plot the temperature of the water versus the salinity of the water, the salt content. So the temperature versus the salt content. And we just make a scatter plot, all right? Now here, um, this is just a blank right here because I wanted to walk you through it, all right? So the temperature goes from, from you know, minus 1.8 up to zero and the salinity goes from 28 to 35. And this is what we call the freezing line, all right? this is where the seawater will freeze. So the saltier the water, the colder it, it will get before it freezes, all right? So, so that's sort of the, the boundary of the freezing water. So this is what we have so far in our cruise, all right? So we made a scatter plot, 
And in this scatter plot, the color, all right, and the size means that we have more water uh, present. So wherever you see bright colors, it means there's a lot of the water. And where you see the little blue dots, it means there's very little of the water. So you can see that we're out here during the freeze up and most far and away, the most water we're seeing is that winter water. Okay, and that's very exciting. And that's what we're trying to learn more about. So geographically, I can show you where that water is. All right, again, here's what we've done so far. And I've colored in all the places where we saw that winter water. And this was a bit of a surprise to me to see so much of this winter water on the shelf. And here's a, a noticeable uh, aspect. If, all this, if winter water fills up the entire Beaufort shelf and it's transferred offshore, all right, it would supply about half the amount of winter water that's coming from the Chukchi through Barrow Canyon. So it's, a, it's a potentially a really important thing here that we don't know that much about. Now, one of the big things here is if the water can get transferred from the shelf into the basin, all right? And that's a big if, so how does that happen? Well, I told you about those Pacific born storms and how they cause upwelling. You're bringing stuff from down deep up to the shelf. Well, the other type of storm, the type of storm that was causing the erosion, all right, with the westerly winds, well, that type of storm causes the water at the bottom of the shelf to go out into the basin. So it's kind of the reverse. So it's that kind of storm that will take this cold water and bring it out into the basin. And those types of storms are just as common as the other types of storms, all right? So the fact that we're getting, gonna get more storms going into the future uh, just makes this even more important to, to be studying. Okay, so that's sort of the story about uh, our workhorse measurements um, and the project that's funded by, by NSF and the Arctic Observing Network. But I also wanted to point out that we have um, lots of other projects going on, and, and these are ancillary projects, all right? And, and it's, they're being carried out by a team of international researchers. And, and, and these folks are making use of the platform. They're making use of the fact that the Sukuliak is up here. Uh, we have bunk space and, and, and we're you know measuring a really interesting part of the Arctic in an interesting time of year. So we have a bunch of different projects. I don't have time to go through all the projects, but I'll just mention a couple of them, um, a little bit about them. Uh, we have several groups that are doing sediment sampling. And the reason for that is threefold. We want to reconstruct the past history of the region. We want to document and map uh, harmful algal bloom cysts in the sediments. And we want to measure black carbon. And for those of you who don't know what black carbon is, it just means it's carbon that's been burned. It's like ash that's gotten into the ocean and, and somehow gotten into the sediments. Um, and they're using that sort of as a, as a tracer. So let me just say a couple of words about this second one here. Um, uh, Gay mentioned that the uh, Norseman II was out uh, this summer, and I know that you all heard a nice talk about that expedition um, earlier this fall. Um, it was the first really extensive view of, of or you know, yeah, view of, of the situation regarding harmful algal blooms, and and we discovered a massive bloom, uh, which you know was interesting and concerning. And, and, and I think most of you know, uh, you know about, about it here. So one of the aspects of this bloom is with all these cells in the water, when, when, you know, when the sunlight disappears and the water gets cold and, and freeze up starts, uh, they form cysts and these cysts can sink down into the sediments, all right? And then they'll sit there and then perhaps next season when you get the warmer water coming back in, they can germinate, they can rise up into the water and then they can bloom. So it's really important to know where these cysts end up, all right? And in the past, we've seen these blooms east of Point Barrow, all right? So we're out here, to, partly here, to map where these cysts are to give us some insights about where you might be seeing blooms. So that's an important part of the sediment work. Uh, we have different sediment uh, uh, instruments here. We have what's called a multi-core, and that's sort of what it sounds like here. It's, it, it's a bunch of different cores here. And we raise that up over the fantail, drop it into the water down to the bottom, and it comes up with multiple cores. You can see the cores here, right? So that's one device. Another device is called a vibro core. And that's something I'd never seen uh, before personally until this cruise. That's a long tube here. You can see it hanging off the fantail. It's going into the water. It's a long tube with this device up in here. And they lower that down to the bottom. And right before it hits the sediments, they turn on a motor and that vibrates the core, or it vibrates the tube. And then it can, they put it down into the sediments and the fact that it's vibrating means it can penetrate deeper into the bottom and it pulls out a really long core. And here's what one of these cores look like. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a long core, it's the longest core I've ever seen. 
and they were very excited. You can see the two graduate students with big smiles on their faces there. All right. So that, that was our first VibraCore, but unfortunately the VibraCore device broke. So we don't have that operationally anymore, but we do have a substitute and that's called a gravity core, right? That uh, no, no vibrating involved, it's just a gravity. And it's still kind of long and they send that down and, and that's been working successfully for us. And then the last type of sediment device we have is called a grab. And, and here's a picture of one up close. It, 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 essentially, there's two sides of a shovel, if you will, that are spring-loaded, all right? And the thing gets lowered down into the bottom. And when it hits the bottom, these two um, chambers come together very quickly and they scoop up like a shovel. They scoop up the top layer of the sediments. So here it is coming out of the water and the sediments are inside that chamber there. And then the scientists can you know, see what's in the sediments and also filter it and see what critters are, on, are, are down uh, on the top of the sediments. All right, so that's the sediment program. Um, we also have an underway program that's monitoring isotopes in both the, the water and the air. And, and the water part of it is they're using these isotopes, isotopes to try to sort out the different uh, components of the freshwater. They're trying to distinguish, you know, where the glacial meltwater is, where the river runoff is, precipitation. So the different components of the freshwater. For the atmosphere part of it, they're measuring changes in the Arctic evaporation in response to sea ice loss. And they're also tracing the Arctic source water vapor as it's transported around the entire Arctic. So that's the goals of that. Um, their, their air monitoring is pretty neat. They, 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 uh, the technicians on the ship mounted an air intake on the bow mast here, and the tube runs down all the way down to the main lab all right, and you can actually sort of see it here, all right, and then it goes into this device here, and that's where they measure the water vapor for all those isotopes. And, 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 and this out of the sink is where they're getting the water that they're measuring the isotopes. So the operation, that's what they're doing. Uh, we also are measuring nutrients and dissolved organic carbon, and, and that's some of the properties that are coming out of those plastic bottles I told you about. So here's those Niskin bottles that we, we, we trigger at various different depths. So lots of water sampling going on. And of course we had the high tech sampling of the ice, all right, using the good old fishnet technique. All right, so um, like we said, we're sitting off of um, Prudhoe now and in another four or five days, uh, we'll make it to Point Barrow, Barrow Canyon. And at that point, we're gonna emerge from the ice and we'll start to sample the open water of the Chukchi Sea. And uh, our plan is to do, you know, a section across Barrow Canyon, a, a section across Ledyard Bay, a section uh, emanating from Point Hope, and hopefully get a, a rare late season crossing of Bering Strait right through here. We did this Bering Strait crossing five or six times this summer in an Norseman, so it'd be very exciting to get a late season uh, occupation. So that's the plan as we work our way back to Seward. Um, having said that, uh, Mother Nature may have other plans for us. So uh, here I just took a screenshot from windy.com earlier today, and that's not conducive for us doing work in the open water of the Chuck GC. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens at this time of year. It, it, it's going to be an adventure, not only in the Chuck but trying to get all the way back uh, through the bearing during storm season back to back to Seward. So stay tuned about that. We have uh, we're lucky to have a community observer and a seabird observer, uh, Julie and Lloyd here. And they spend their time on the bridge uh, scanning the horizon uh, for polar bears, seals, uh, seabirds. So far, we've seen 16 polar bears, including these two guys who uh, meandered up close to the ship uh, one, one evening. Uh, you might think that there's not a lot of birds, and you would be right, but there are some birds, and it's important to document them. So here, here's a picture taken by uh, Julia of a flock of common eiders. And we also have a, an extensive outreach program that's being carried out. And, and, and I think this is pretty neat. The goal of the project is to connect high school students from three diverse schools in different regions of the US with one another and with the scientists and the crew on the Sukuliak. So the participating schools are from Brevik Mission, Alaska, from Wheeling, West Virginia, and from Providence, Rhode Island. So those are very diverse areas, right? And, um, and uh, why I think this is pretty exciting is, you know, they are, they're following along with us on the ship, but they're also engaging each other and learning about their own, um, you know, cultures and, 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 and what it's like in their different parts of the country. So, so I think that's a, it's, it's a really neat program. It's being coordinated by um, Amanda here, who's uh, also our photographer, 
Um, I'll show you a bunch of her pictures in just a second, and this is her at work. All right, so I, I do want to stress that for us to do the science and, and, and have successful uh, measurements, we rely on each department of the ship and every crew member, each of whom plays a critical role. On the bridge, on deck, in the machine shop, in the engine room, and in the galley. And I should say, we're very much looking forward to uh, Thanksgiving meal in, in just a little bit, um, prepared by these talented folks in the galley. So in addition to being, uh, you know, being an, out here during an exciting time of the year in terms of the science, for instance, that winter water formation, it's also just an amazing time to be in the Pacific Arctic. The sun is low in the sky, uh, although we're going to lose the sun in a few days, and we're seeing so many different types of ice. Uh, this type of ice, I don't think the folks driving the ship are, are terribly fond of. Uh, same with me. This is the kind of thing we're trying to avoid. This is the type of ice that excites me, and that's because this is newly freezing ice, all right? And that's what's forming this cold winter water, all right? Have lots of nice sunsets. And we've also been treated to the Northern Lights and also to some just amazing um, landscapes of the North Slope. Okay, so th that's my presentation. Um, and uh, thanks for, for listening. And I'd be uh, happy to entertain any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Bob. That sounds like uh, that was very interesting about a slice of life on Sekuliak as well as your main topic. Um, before we do questions, while people are thinking of their questions, be sure to give um, Bob and Sekuliak uh, some love there in the chat box. He's taking uh, extra uh, time away from his work to talk to us tonight and give us a little slice of what's going on. And with that, does anyone have any questions right off the bat? I know I've got a couple. Let me see. Charlie, you've got a question. Go ahead. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I'm uh, I'm so impressed with that boat. Um, the mm -hmm. so you know I've been a biologist for a long time, and I've worked off the the, the land and on shore fast ice in the winter uh, here at Nome. Back when the the Abima gold dredge was was in place. We did a lot of uh, in, environmental impact study kind of work, and and that's when I first realized how much fresh water was stored by the the shelf ice, if you will. The we put down uh, ROVs on a umbilical cord and and drove them around under the ice, and there were there were sheets of uh, slush coming up from the bottom from from freshwater seeps under the seawater, and this, you know, the super cooled seawater and fresh water coming up through it would freeze into these slushy curtains, and they it accumulated on the on the bottom of the shore fast ice, and then you could you sometimes could find uh, fresh water and crab bottles and things on the shelf ice too, but I I wondered. Uh, all that fresh water that just kind of accumulates all winter long with the, the shore fast ice. Uh, seems like that that would release a lot of of uh, cold water and fresh water when it does melt and, and makes its way north on the near shore Alaskan current. Is that I didn't really understand if that was part of this uh, cold layer that you were talking about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank. Thanks for that. That sounds uh, awfully fascinating. What what you what you've done, and what you're doing. Um, so yeah. So in the spring, with with the melting of the freshwater, that's a huge part of, of what's going on here. And 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 part of the reason it's so important is because, um, you know, in the spring, 
when the sunlight returns, um, there's still a lot of that cold water hanging around that has high nutrients, all right? So that starts the whole process going. And, and the fresh water will, will essentially stratify the water and it, it will, you know, once you start growing a phytoplankton, they'll be trapped near the surface because of that fresh water. And that allows them to grow and bloom. If you didn't have that fresh water there, uh, you know, then the phytoplankton wouldn't stay up near the surface and, and you wouldn't get these such large blooms. So the fresh water is a is critical part of the story. And we see fresh water going by the mooring, although I have to point out that we don't measure the surface in our mooring. So we're missing a lot of, a lot of that fresh water you're talking about. But still, even at depth, we see a lot of fresh water go by. And again, important. But in terms of this winter water story, yeah, what I probably should have done is explained a little bit more what that process is, but it's pretty simple, okay? So here in the Beaufort right now, uh, freeze up is happening, all right? So the second the water starts to freeze, um, as you know, the ice is fresh and it, and it leaves behind the salt or rejects the salt is what we call it. And that stays in the surface water. So that very cold, salty water near the surface becomes more dense than the water below. And so it's going to sink. And that process is really fascinating. It can sink right down to the bottom. The Beaufort shelf is pretty shallow. So it sinks right down to the bottom. It stirs up the water and it brings up stuff that was in the sediments up into the water. All right. Because those nutrients, a lot of them are in the sediments and that winter water comes down and stirs them up into the water. And that's how you get a lot of the nutrients in that. Okay. So, so that's the process that's happening. And that's why it's so neat to be out now, because it's just now when the water is freezing and that very process is happening. And, and the mixing up part, it's, it's really amazing to lower your, what we call the CTD, to, to measure the temperature and all those other properties from the surface down to the bottom. And, and your sensors are just, the, the, it's just a straight line. It's the same value of salt. It's the same value of temperature from top to bottom. And that's because you've been mixing up. Oh, did you do something? With the thing? No. Okay. All right, I thought I froze. So anyway, that's how you form that winter water. And I, I said that this is a dynamic area in terms of the ice. So in the middle of winter, you're completely covered with ice and maybe that's not happening so much. But the second the wind blows, all right, you can get these leads. Sometimes these short pass leads and further out you get leads. Anytime you have a lead, it's gonna freeze immediately and form more of this water. So, so it's sort of an ongoing process. All right, Charlie, did that give you an answer? Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, I made a big faux pas and we have a caller on the line and I, I'm just going to throw that out there, caller. Um, if you have a question at any time while we're talking, just bust in because it is really difficult to be a caller on a Zoom call because you can't raise your hand or flash your video or do the cartoons. And if you're having trouble, and this has been going on, if you have trouble getting a hold of or unmuting, which might be star six, um, call my cell phone 907-934-1149. We had to do that the other night via text. So 434-1149. All right. I have a winter water question as well, and I don't see any questions or hands raised at this time. So Bob, on your slide that had kind of the bars going across and winter water was like uh -huh. blue sort of hash marks. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So my question, and then learning that winter water, you're sort of, I, I think you were saying, or what I've learned tonight is that the winter water is really local, locally made, which would be Beaufort Sea okay. water. That one, yeah. Yes. Does it look like for yes. 2021, 22, the year we just had, there's nothing so far, or maybe one little slice of room. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. So, so is this, this winter water that you're showing, is this what's locally made on the Beaufort Sea near shore area? Or is this, when you're talking winter water, what about the Bering Strait? winter water right or or is that any of or okay. am i kind of confusing two things you, you, you have you have it right so let me just sort okay. of you know lay it out for you again yeah so we, we the same process that i just described in terms of the ice freezing and the water becoming cold and salty and sinking that happens in the bering sea that happens sure. in the chukchi sea right 
and and that and there's a lot of it going on. And as I've described, ultimately that water in the Bering and the Chukchi, all right, in the Bering, it comes through Bering Strait, it eventually gets off the Chukchi shelf, right? It goes all the way north, you know, in these current systems, it gets to the edge of the shelf and some of it turns right and goes by my moorings. So this, my mooring, so this mooring is measuring Chukchi and Bering winter water. And that's oh, why, you okay. know, we didn't see any, of it. I don't know why we didn't see any of it, but that's what it's saying. However, my mooring is right near Point Barrow, right? The Beaufort shelf is farther downstream from my mooring. And all that winter water that's being formed locally on the Beaufort shelf, which is different than the Chukchi and the Bering, on the Beaufort shelf, that stuff I'm not going to see with the mooring, right? Because that's downstream of my mooring. Are you able to then differentiate because the isotopic signature, the, 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 the stuff the water is kind of made of, um, you can... I don't know if you can tell the difference. I mean, certainly you can tell the difference if you went to the Bering Sea and took a, a sample of water. And if you went to the Chukchi Sea and took a sample of water, can you differentiate or the Beaufort Sea, but you said you won't be able to see that. Yep. Could you differentiate what you're looking at as far as winter water? I just don't know how you're so figuring in, out. In terms of from the physical oceanography, the answer is probably no, right? Just ah, in terms of temperature and okay. salinity. But but there's other ways you can do it, right? And 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 I mentioned those isotopes, all right? So with the isotopes, you can distinguish like you know Mackenzie River water or Colville River water, all right? And 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 that way you can sort of you know learn a little bit more about the source waters uh, 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 of this winter water or the source of, of the water that freezes and becomes the winter water. All right, and 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 I'm sure there's other ways too, Gay. I'm just again as a physical oceanographer, uh, you know, there may be other quantities that that uh, you can use to distinguish uh, these different water masses, or where they're. Yeah, I'm just wondering where the where the Bering Strait. I'm always interested in the Bering Strait water, so it looks like you're able. So the to Bering Strait water. So so part of it, like I said, you know, I, I didn't have time to go through all of this, but you know, the Bering Strait water flows to the north, as you know, and it gets to the edge of the shelf much of that water goes through Barrow Canyon. And when it comes down Barrow Canyon, some of it turns to the right and it goes right by that mooring that I have. And a lot of it turns to the left, all right, and flows ah, towards okay. the East Siberian. Okay. It comes out and does this split, all right? We didn't know about that split 20 years ago, right? I thought it would all go this way and that's why I stuck my mooring over there, but it turns out that more of it goes that way than okay. goes this way. So all right. that water's going. All right, thank you. That That is very... Um educational for, for my brain. So thank you very much. Rick sure. Toman has his hand up. Go ahead, Rick. Hey, thanks, Bob. Uh, really great, uh, informative presentation. I, I'm looking at the graphic that you have up there, and I am i can't help but think, uh, looking like back at, uh, at some of the other years there that had low Bering Sea ice. This, this past winter, of course, we had, in, in extent, it was a, a decent year, but we had, in the northern Bering Sea, the ice quality was so poor last winter and so thin, and I'm wondering um, if that's contributing to the lack of that, uh, that any uh, winter water signature in this year, um, especially looking at like 2018-19 there, 2016-17, which also had very low uh, winter water signatures. Thanks. Okay, that, that that's that's like a thousand dollar question, Rick. Uh, thank, thanks for raising it, and, and that's a very thing that we would like to try to understand. And and what you just said is fascinating. That could very well be the reason, right? And so we need to now that we have a twenty year record, um, we can go and start to 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 you know maybe make some correlation. So so maybe you can help us with that. Um, so that's one factor, but then there's other factors too, right? Like, you know, I just talked about with, with Gay, the water comes out of Barrow Canyon and splits. So maybe some years, you know, more of that winter water goes the other way and that's why it's not going by the mooring. So, so there's, and then there's also, you know, in the, once, you know, you form this water in the Bering Sea, it goes through Bering Strait. And then as it's traveling across the Chukchi, if it experiences leads, which it does, it can get further, you know, transformed, right? And so that's another factor that can contribute to what we're seeing downstream in my mooring. So different different sort of factors involved, but what you just said is probably a, a, a very important one. We really need to pursue that. So thanks for raising that. Great, thanks. 
All right. Looking for any other questions? Nothing in the chat or speak up. We still have the caller. Yeah, um, yeah, the caller. Uh, yeah, Rob Kaler. Hi, hi, Rob Kaler. Yeah, hi, Bob. Um, wow, I feel like these are TED Talks right now. That's great. I'm with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Migratory Bird Management. Um, yeah, that was so good. I learned so much. Um, one of my thoughts, yeah, and thank you, Gay, for that question about the, the winter water. I was a little confused about, uh, about that. But then um, e, eDNA, are, are you guys doing uh, environmental DNA? Are you able to do anything that, with that? I mean, I, maybe that's more of a sediment trap not, kind of thing. Yeah, not, not on this cruise, um, but uh, yeah, it, it, just not on this cruise, but it's done, it, not by me, I'm a physical oceanographer, but I, I've seen it done on other cruises. Um, and one of the nice things about this program, you know, it, it's again, it's funded by the Arctic Observing Network and, and it's funded to go out and do this mooring work and do this large scale survey of the boundary current. But we don't have a heck of a lot of physical oceanographers necessary to do our work. So we have open bunks. And, and, and what happens is people, you know, get wind of this and, and, and they come along and they take ancillary measurements. So like these isotope measurements and these sediment measurements, these are things that I wouldn't be taking, but they're really valuable, you know, because they, they add to, to the story. So, you know, this DNA that you're talking about, um, you know, if you can measure that from a ship, um, you know, from the Niskan bottles, then yes, that, that, you know, it'd be a wonderful thing to have uh, to, to help fill out this story. Yeah. And yeah, Julia, please say hello from Rob Kaler, Migratory Bird. Uh, Julia, the observer that you have for seabirds. Um, and, and part of that would be the baseline for invasive species as well for the, the uh, envir environmental DNA. Um, and that's something uh, we're thinking about with Fish and Wildlife Service as well. And then um, maybe one more question. Yeah, lighting on the vessel and impacts that that might have with um, uh, migratory birds. So just wondering what you guys are doing for that. Probably you, yes, you're so an oceanographer, so not not your well, realm. Okay, so something you can respond to. Well, yeah. Be before we sailed, uh, Rob, we were we were given directions from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on on you know how what to do to minimize our impacts, right, on these endangered species. And of course, birds are, are one of them. In particular, the the, the uh, spectacle lighters were one, and and there was another another type of eider I can't remember that we had to watch out for. And they did talk about, you know, what do we do if we encounter these things? And this also includes polar bears. And it was explicitly mentioned that, you know, be, be, try to minimize the light, the amount of light that you're emitting from the ship. All right, I showed you that you could see us from satellite. Well, we obviously need some light, right? We got these huge, huge searchlights, which we need to get through the ice, all right? But we are aware that this can attract birds. And so we did discuss this, um, you know, beforehand to, to, to try to do what we can to try to minimize this. And it was really good to have the, the community observer and the seabird observer on board. Uh, uh, Julia is prepared that if any bird, you know, strikes a ship or just lands on a ship and is, and is either dead, uh, you know, soon dead or acting weird or whether she knows what to do. She's got the proper equipment to, to take a dead bird and, and we'll bring it on board, stick it in the freezer, bring it back. Um, and of course, Lloyd, the, the, the polar bear observer, we've had 16 sightings so far. So he has to write a detailed report for each one of those sightings. I have to uh, you know, submit that report to the US Fish and Wildlife Service. I just got another one tonight, which after this call, I'll go and I'll submit that to, to US Fish and Wildlife Service. So yes, we are aware of these things, uh, Rob, and, 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 and we're trying to, trying to you know, do our due diligence to, 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 to have a minimal impact. Yeah, thanks. I've learned so much. And um, thank you, Gay, for, for hosting these meetings. So yeah, uh, and just amazing that you have the, the connectivity to present from the Sekuliak. That's really cool. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. And I, I do thank you for saying that about the I mean, you look at Bob Picard and uh, I mean, he is high definition on my computer. And I think, wow, I wish we had this for all our communities, but it's brilliant. And it's really a great resource for all of us. Um, and thanks for also mentioning the lights. You know, one of, I don't know about everyone else, but when he showed the picture of the satellite, I, you know, I thought Utkiagovic would have 
the big light footprint, but wow, that was really eye-opening to me. Prudhoe Bay's extensive light phenomenon there. So that was uh, that was kind of a learning experience for me, and I, I my jaw dropped. Yeah. Uh, quick mm -hmm. question for Bob, and that is. Um, hearing that the current splits and that our Bering Strait water goes left into the East Siberian Sea, so over by Wrangell Island and the Northwest Chukchi Sea, the northern shore of the Chukotka Peninsula. And we have um, recently two years of, of commercial fishing going on for the first time in the Northwest Chukchi Sea. Uh, looks presumably... I think everyone's under the, the suspicion that they're fishing Pollock. They've been from August to October, they were, uh, there was, I think half a dozen commercial trawlers up there and learning that some of that Bering Strait water, I'm hoping that you're unlike some of the other entities and that you have good communications or there's some transboundary exchange of information at the physical oceanography level with Chukotka or the federal Russian biologists that are studying, physical oceanographers like yourself that are studying the fate of the currents? Uh, well, probably not as much as we should, Gay. Um, so yes, uh, that, which is unfortunate. Uh, I, you know, I was lucky enough to be part of this joint U.S.-Russian program a, 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 a number of years ago called Rizalka, which I'm sure you know about. And we had collaborating scientists in Russia um, and as part of that program, um, I had a graduate student um, from, from Shearshaw Institute in, in Moscow, and, and I still work with her. Uh, she's one of my main contacts uh, uh, in Russia. But um, once Rosalka sort of went away, that sort of, you know, really curtailed our, our communications, our lines of communication. So, I'm, you know, I'm sorry to say it's not what it should be, Gay, to, to be honest. That's okay. I'm ever hopeful I'm going to find the group that's like, oh, yeah, we... We're, we we put the whole puzzle together, not just the thing. So thank you very much. I, I was, you know. Hey, Gay, I just want to say that we're going to get underway again here. So it might get a little bit noisy because we're going to start bashing through the ice. I had the ship stay put for this presentation, but now we're going to we're going to get okay. moving on. Okay, time's up. Next, so. Time's up. That's all right. Thanks. It'll give us a little um, Arctic ambiance. Um, <laughs> and they got to do what you got to do. Just go for it. And Charlie has his hand up. How are you doing with questions? You all right, Bob? You can handle a couple more. Oh, I'm fine. Okay, yeah, I'm fine. Of course. All right, Charlie. I see your hand up. Go for it. Okay, thanks. I'm uh, I'm fixated on the cold water layer and and its formation. I hope I'm not a bore on this. The so the way I understand um, sea ice freezing is that as the as the ice freezes, it drives the salt from the ice, and and that creates vertical pores in the ice. And it, I've observed that firsthand, and that you get out on the the thin ice here, and and the hoarfrost on top is just salty enough to pickle your tongue. It, it's super brine, it, so it really does drive the salt from the ice out those pores, both up and down. And and it seems to me that 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 super saline solution being driven out of the ice would would be heavier and and cause you know the water right adjacent to the ice to settle and as you described. But that that process goes on even on three foot thick ice around here. Uh, I've done core samples and looked for ice algae and so forth, and and you, you find that that spongy layer of porous ice on the bottom of the ice here when we cut our crab pot holes and in three foot thick ice or even five foot thick ice. So, so it seems like that would be a continual process all winter long, as long as as long as ice was forming, as long as the temperature was well below freezing, it would be would be manufacturing the cold cold water that you're talking of does that sound right yes it does and, and charlie you're much more of an ice expert than i am i'm, I'm not an ice scientist so so I, I will defer to you on on all that it's fascinating what you say i'm very impressed um but from from the physical oceanography standpoint um 
you know, we are intensely interested in that salty water that you're talking about, because again, it, it's unstable, it's heavier than the stuff below. And so it just drives this whole process of convection and mixing and pulling stuff up from the sediments that's just so important for lots of different reasons. Um, and I'm fascinated to hear that, you know, you're still seeing that growth, uh, you know, with the, with the three foot uh, thick ice. Um, I, I know that, it, I, I suspect that, that you're not getting as much when it's that thick than, than when you're first freezing it in, in, you know, very thin ice. And part of the reason I say that is, is we, we, do, we did have a mooring array in the Beaufort, which I did not talk about. Can you hear me? Okay, I thought I yep, cut out there. We can hear you. Yep. We, no, we had a mooring array. We had a mooring array in a Beaufort that, that the instruments were at the bottom. They weren't right underneath the ice. Um, but we had instruments expanding from the inner shelf all the way to the outer shelf. And where the most, where the saltiest winter water was, was measured was where you had the most unstable ice cover, all right? The, 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 the most occurrence of leads, all right? And, and, and the smallest mean values over the winter. So I think that, you know, it, it, it maybe it's a little more prevalent in those areas where you're just starting to refreeze that fresh water, uh, you know, near the surface. Um, but it's fascinating that it goes on, you know, uh, around the year, uh, you know, around, throughout the winter. And, and so I'm, I'm really interested now to understand how much of this winter water is being formed in the Beaufort and where it goes. And it's really piqued my interest to be out in this time of year and see this process happening right in front of us. And I'm, and I'm really amazed at how much of the water we're seeing. It's like almost filling the entire shelf. And, and this is only November. So thanks for your question. So, so that, 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 as long as I have the mic up, the- I can, always, I can always just push the button, Charlie. <laughs> okay, the, the, the crab potholes we, we have here um, freeze in at first on the top and then further down the hole as time goes on. So your, coal, your, your crab pothole becomes a cone eventually if, you, if you're out there for a month or so with the top being narrower and the bottom being broader. But, they, but new ice is forming on the whole depth of the, of the shore fast ice. And, and you're right, it, it's freezing harder at the top than it is at the bottom. So it probably is exactly as you described, but it, if, if, you're, if you have uh, air temperatures in the 10 degrees Fahrenheit area, you will see, see what I'm talking about. And, uh, and it, it does carry through the entire ice column to the water interface with, with the freezing. Anyway, thanks. Thank you. Very fascinating. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. So, so kind of what I'm learning is that brine rejection, when the salt is escaping out of the ice, is variable depending on the age of and thickness of the ice. Is that right? Then, all right, got it. Wow, thanks, Charlie. Good question, and thanks, Bob, for answering. With that. Any last questions, comments? With that, I don't know if you can stay on, Bob, just for like two seconds more after everyone goes, um, but we will Hello. say good night at this point. And the next straight science, there are no straight sciences until after Thanksgiving, which is next week. So everybody enjoy the holiday and we'll see you all December 1st. You'll hear about that one. So thank you all for coming and have a good night.